I remember an incident uh, uh, where Waverley Police came to my house, you know, at Bronte Beach in, in, in Sydney, and um, you know the Maroubra Target Response Group rolled up, tanks, helicopters, police, the whole lot. Of, you know, I was going through a cocaine psycho, so I thought there was gunmen surrounding my house. You know, they turn up and there was no gunmen surrounding my house. And, and, and 24 hours later, I'm, I'm I'm locked up at the Prince of Wales Hospital in the psychiatric ward with a you know file um, not fit for society, not to be released. You know, and um, you know, and when the psychologist asked me, uh, you know, what I'd been doing and, and, and where I, I was heading, you know, I said I've been looking after David Beckham in Madrid, and uh, they don't believe you, you know, and 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 even less, you know, when you tell them, you know, you you, you have to be released because in three days' time you're headed to Colombia um, as chief scout for the Socceroos in the 2006 World Cup. Yeah, so the, the the insanity and madness of it all is is. It's hard to even put into words, you know, in, in the middle of a cocaine and crack cocaine addiction, the Socceroos send me to Colombia. I'm Andy Burnell, um, former Socceroo, now working as Head of Athletic Development to, to Central Coast Mariners and uh, many consider me a, a pioneer of Australian football and uh, I was the first Socceroo to, to play in Spain and uh, the first to captain an English football club. I was born in Canberra, um, the son of um, Spanish immigrants. Canberra was very much a, a white Australia city, town back in the day and uh, not easy, uh, being the son of immigrants, um, you know, it was a, a daily battle, you know, uh, against being called a wog and, you know, the, the racism that, that, you know, was, was pretty prevalent back then. Uh, there was a point where I had to decide between rugby league and, and, and football and, uh, you know, the, the Spanish background took me towards football and, uh, and we went that way. And that led me to the AIS uh, and then a tournament in, in, in Europe captaining the AOS. We ended up playing against Real Madrid, uh, their under-20 side that were managed at the time by Vicente del Bosque. The key highlights were one signing for a Spanish La Liga club who at the time had five Spanish internationals in the side. Um, I was still a young under-20 uh, you know, soccer, soccer international and um, so for me it was still very much a learning curve but to go to such a, a big giant of Spanish football uh, and then within six months be playing you know a, at places like the Bernabeu Stadium, you know, against Valencia, against Real Madrid, against Barcelona, against Deportivo La Coruña, you know, for a young, young kid, you know, coming from Australia who a year earlier had been uh, at the AIS, it was just, uh, just unbelievable. Uh, the most difficult parts are leaving home. You know, you you grow up in in, in this beautiful country. Uh, and you go to another beautiful country, which, which was Spain, but, you know, your whole childhood is, is here. Uh, you miss birthdays, you miss Christmases, you miss a lot of things that, um, you know, people take for granted, you know, the, the normal family stuff. And sometimes you find yourself, you know, um, in lonely places, uh, in, in rooms on, on your own, you know, chasing this football dream. Um, and sometimes you look in the mirror and, and you talk to yourself and you think, you know, is it, is it all worth it? Back in those days, with regard to mental health and, and how it affected us, um, it wasn't a big issue then. It, it was, no one really spoke of it a lot. Um, it wasn't until my later years that, that I probably realised that, that I'd, I'd gone through some, some, uh, some tough times in life, that, that I've in, in, encountered things that, that may be affected me further on down the track. I think unconsciously, uh, you hardened your soul, you, you hardened your heart. And uh, for example, now I, you know, people bang on about birthdays and, and, and big celebrations, you know, at Christmas time and, and birthdays. I, I kind of, my, my brain kind of zones out. I don't really allow them to, to be big kind of things in my life still because I, they brought me a lot of sadness and unhappiness at times. I retired because I just couldn't play on my left knee anymore. You know, from from birth, my left knee was deformed. Seven to eight operations, I can't even remember the, the number of them now, with hundreds of holes drilled in there and basically played a career on one leg. It's been pain since I was a kid and it's still painful today, every single day when I work, wake up. Well, after retiring, uh, I was unsure of, of what I was going to do and, and somehow I ended up uh, on a train heading to London. Uh, 
to an office in Mayfair and uh, where I was to meet a, a gentleman by the name of Tony Stevens, who was David Beckham's agent, Michael Owen's agent, um, Dwight York's agent, and uh, heading to see him was uh, an opportunity uh, to, to maybe learn the trade of becoming a football agent uh, under who at the, a man who at the time was probably the, the leading um, football sports agent on the planet. And a friend of mine had organised that for me and she said uh, if you are given more than five minutes uh, by Tony you'll have done well and uh, an hour later uh, Tony was in the office making me a coffee so uh, I think that interview went pretty well. It was just a, a kind of different way of being within that environment um, but I quickly adjusted and, and being around players like Beckham and, and York and uh, Michael Owen and Ronaldo Nazario and Figo and Zidane and all these people. It wasn't that hard actually, they, they embraced me as well, they knew I was a, an international footballer, they knew I'd played at, uh, uh, at a pretty decent level as well. The pressure came away from the actual football, the pressure came uh, with the actual um, day-to-day working with David Beckham when that, when that kind of arose and uh, I ended up being his personal manager in, in Spain at Real Madrid. It was a, an intense period uh, in my life and, and you know, a time where it was a, you know, a learning curve in many ways for me as well, you know, to, to be around uh, uh, such a mega superstar, uh, the whole family, um, which came with, with a lot of uh, global attention, paparazzi and beside us every day, you know, two SAS commandos and, and two Cuban military officers that, um, you know, wouldn't leave our side. So it was, um, it was a different way of, of, of being involved in, and seeing life and experiencing life. My, my role in, in, in Spain was um, not so much on, on the agent one where I was doing deals. It was more um, personally managing David, uh, getting him to training, um, you know, being at parties, you know, uh, with Ronaldo, with Roberto Carlos, with Zidane, with Figo, with all these people. Times where we would, um, you know, have threats coming in, terrorist uh, threats, you know, uh, wanting to kidnap or, or possibly kidnapping the kids. So you'd have to address all these things, you know, with security teams, uh, being chased every single minute of the day by paparazzi, you know, there wasn't a let up at all, you know, it was, I mean, hundreds of them on motorbikes, in cars, and um, your whole world was, was almost like uh, you were living in, uh, like you were a chased animal every single day and and, uh, uh, in the book I write uh, it culminated one day where there was a a car crash uh, that I was in uh, with paparazzi Uh, we were pulled to safety by um, SAS commandos and um, you know I I was knocked out for a a small period of time came back to and and the whole car was set upon by paparazzi you know and it reminded me very much of the uh, you know Princess Di days where um, they were um, they were hungry for blood hungry for the photo there was there was talk amongst the the commandos that uh, Ed of the terrorist group had eyes on the boys. So that then um, brought a whole different kind of perspective to to this you know football journey in Madrid for David and the family. It just made you realise you know you were not far from possible death at any moment in time. Oh, cocaine was was everywhere. Cocaine was was around when um, when I was playing football. You know I just never went down that path. Um, but you know once. Uh, once I got out of that path, you know, um, it, it was I was always very um, uh, obsessive compulsive. So, you know, if, if, if we're going to become a footballer, well, we're going to do it 100 percent. We're going to do a million percent um, and uh, and we're going to be disciplined with everything around that as well. And if that means no drinking, no drugs, no this, no that, then that's what happened. And that's how it was. But after football, you know, I didn't have to adhere to those restrictions and, and, and those guidelines. So, um, you know, and, and it was one of those things that, uh, you know, I was offered a line of cocaine one day and I took it, you know, and it's, um, I still regret it to this day. You know, it, um, you know, I laugh about some of the stories, but uh, there was a lot more darkness than, than, than beautiful days. And, and it was um, it was a flight I wish I hadn't have taken. Uh, rock Bottom was in a prison cell in Reading, Reading FC. I, I'd captained that club, that wonderful club, and, and uh, I found myself uh, in a jail cell one morning. It had been on the back of uh, uh, probably 10 days of not sleeping. On crack cocaine, and, and I was an addict, but I, I was a, a working addict, and still maintaining a, a normal life. Um, 
but now looking back on it, it really wasn't a normal life. It, it was uh, everything was just a buzz around me. Uh, I remember an incident uh, uh, where Waverley Police came to my house, you know, at Bronte Beach in, in, in Sydney, and um, you know the Maroubra Target Response Group rolled up, tanks, helicopters, police, the whole lot of you know. I was going through a cocaine psychosis. I thought there was gunmen surrounding my house you know they turn up and there was no gunmen surrounding my house and, and, and 24 hours later I'm, I'm I'm locked up at the Prince of Wales hospital in the psychiatric ward with a you know file um, not fit for society not to be released you know and um, you know and when the psychologist asked me you know what I'd been doing and, and, and where I, I was heading you know I said I've been looking after David Beckham in Madrid and uh, I don't believe you you know and 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 even less, you know, when you tell them, you know, you, you, you have to be released because in three days' time you're headed to Colombia um, as chief scout for the Socceroos in the 2006 World Cup. Yeah, so the, the, the insanity and madness of it all is, is, it's hard to even put into words. You know, in, in the middle of a cocaine and crack cocaine addiction, the Socceroos send me to Colombia. We'd qualified for the World Cup 2006 and uh, I'd been chief scout and amongst the madness of, of South America I managed to, to create a, a dossier for, for Gus Hiddink um, who gave it to the players and, and we qualified for the World Cup and then not long after the whole squad was announced and I saw a photo of the Socceroos that played in the 2006 World Cup along with maybe 30 officials that were in a photo at a training camp in Germany, I believe it was. Um, and I thought to myself, wow, you know, I've, I've scouted nine months of South America for you and you couldn't find a spot for your chief scout. It left a real bit of taste in my mouth. So I remember um, getting sent tickets to go and watch the, the qualifier against Uruguay at ANZ Stadium, I think it was. And uh, I turned up uh, with a mate of mine, one of the biggest drug dealers in Sydney at the time and uh, I think he put $9,000 on Bresciano to score the first goal something like that so by a certain time in the match he'd won 40 grand or 45 grand or something like that uh, but I um, all I can remember uh, from that match against Uruguay um, the one that I'd spent many months in South America scouting for was um, sitting in a, a section of ANZ Stadium with a hundred other forgotten ex-Socceroos, you're quickly forgotten in this game and uh, so my release from that was um, I did a line of cocaine on a CD at half time at ANZ when everybody was kind of focused on, uh, I don't know, there's something happening at half time, the teams were inside um, and I was, uh, I was on a different planet so I did a line of cocaine and uh, uh, that got me through the second half and then when it went to penalties and the whole world and the whole stadium and the whole of the country were focused on the penalties at ANZ Stadium, I walked out of the place. For many years I thought I was going uh, kind of nuts, you know, uh, on top of, you know, being addicted to cocaine. Um, uh, there was a period in Spain for a while where, um, you know, I really thought I was going nuts, you know, uh, and didn't find out till many years later um, that we were being hacked uh, uh, by the English press, by the English media, um, that led to a, a big downfall of a, a major, you know, uh, media empire in the UK, and um, that was madness and insanity in itself. You know, you'd go somewhere. There was only a small group of us, like Beck and myself, and the security guards that would know where we were going, and uh, you know, we'd get somewhere. And there were a million paparazzi there, so you know it, it didn't help. You know the, the the whole thing, and it was it was very satisfying. You know, six seven years later, um, maybe three four years ago, that uh, um, Scotland Yard got in touch. You know, the detectives and, 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 and let me know that, that I'd been hacked, that I'd been illegally surveilled for five years, um, that they'd uh, got into my voicemails, got into Beckham's voicemails. Um, so um, it's all done with a purpose. You know, it's all done to to, to cause mayhem. And, cause distress um, so that they can get the good stories um, you know when I got myself into a little bit of trouble uh, they ma manufactured uh, they manufactured things in the press and in the papers to make me look bad and I've been outside courthouses in London 
you know, with people telling me, you got 24 hours to reveal information on David Beckham or we will end your career. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired and um, and decided that uh, I needed to be a winner again in my life for the many reasons that I've already explained. And and that started with hanging around, uh, you know, the right people. So now I'm looking to the future um, in a real positive way. I'm, I'm here at the Central Coast Mariners, Vibe Manager, Head of, head of Athletic Development, um, as one of Monty's assistant coaches. Um, you know, we're chasing uh, dreams of winning A-League titles, of winning, you know, Asian Champions League titles, um, you know, Nothing is too big, you know, as far as uh, my wife uh, and myself are concerned. You know, we're, uh, we're living our best lives here on the coast. It's an amazing place to live. Uh, my daughter's in a fantastic space. Uh, she married UFC star Dan Hooker. So, um, you know, got a little granddaughter called Zoe. Um, and, uh, you know, waking up every day and coming to work here at the Mariners is just, uh, it's just, uh, it's a real blessing. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very, um, happy to still be alive and, and to be able to, to, um, to live that new life.